So the topic for today is food skills and recipes for a modern diverse food and nutrition education. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of background as to why we're doing this and the fact that this webinar forms part of a series of webinars that we're doing. So as the British Nutrition Foundation, we're currently undertaking work to explore what a future modern food education might look like. And it's got four elements to this project. So back in sort of September time last year, we conducted a teacher and pupil survey exploring current and future practice. And uh, the results are on the website for you to have a look at if you're interested. And I'm going to be covering just a few aspects of what the people said in a moment. Um, we also had a half day consensus building event when the recordings, presentations and also the recommendations from that are also available on the website. Following on from that, we've been developing some new recipes to Food of Fact of Life that are more inclusive of our diverse culture and society. And the recipes so far are also available. And then we've also been doing some teacher training and this webinar was part of that. And we've been in some online virtual practical workshops, which have been fantastic and I've really enjoyed doing those with, with teachers. So um, that's sort of the background to what we've been doing. But um, today's webinar particularly is going to be about what do young people want? And that will be looking at the survey that we did. Then Andrew's then going to talk about his curriculum and what's the ideal. Um, it's going to cover some obstacles and particularly looking at the solutions. We're going to think about recipes and practical activities to excite young people. We're going to make sure that we're thinking about health and sustainability and that underpins everything that you do. And then I'm going to come back and talk about the resources and support available from Food of Fact of Life. So thinking about what pupils want, so as part of our work, as I said, we did a survey back sort of September time, and we asked teachers and also their pupils what was important to them about recipes they cooked at school. But also we looked at um, what was important to them about their food nutrition lessons, what they enjoyed, what they didn't enjoy, what they thought a future modern education should look like. And the results were really interesting. But today we're thinking about what pupils want. So um, overall, the pupils responded that they want dishes that are tasty, healthy, family, everyday recipes. But most significantly, they want them to be dishes from around the world that are modern, diverse and reflect different cultures. So this is just a bit more of a breakdown as to what we asked them and how recipes were important to them, what aspects were important. And you'll be able to see the, uh, what the pupils said and also what the teachers said. And it was interesting that um, the pupils said that they wanted, first of all, that the recipes to be tasty. So that's a good thing. The teachers felt it was most important that they were low cost. But then second to that, for both pupils and teachers, it was that they should be healthy. So we were really pleased to see that because we feel that that is actually what should underpin everything that's been done in school and that recipes should follow the Eat Well Guide and they should have a healthy emphasis to them. But then also you'll see in the yellow boxes that we've grouped together anything that sort of relates to culture and diversity and foods from around the world. And particularly for the pupils, it was actually that was most significant when they were actually bunched together. So we thought that was an interesting thing that actually that's what pupils are wanting. They are wanting modern, interesting recipes that uh, perhaps they've seen online or perhaps they've had when they've been out for a meal or got a takeaway so that they can actually cook those, learn them at school and then cook them at home for themselves or their families. A bit more of a breakdown. So we asked them specifically what the pupils had cooked in school and what would they like to cook. So these were age 13 to 18 and um, the green represents what they have cooked and the red represents what they would like to cook. So um, we can see we've got some sort of pizza that's very popular, um, cakes, they've cooked a lot of cakes in school perhaps, um, but they would also like to make pasta dishes, they've made a lot of desserts maybe, and they're not quite so keen on making desserts. They want to make savoury dishes. And then we thought what was interesting was about the particular cuisines that they'd like to make. So Indian, Japanese, Thai, Mexican, um, and then also looking at bread and morning goods. So we thought this was quite a good sort of 
example of, of the kind of things that, that young people would like to make. Now we also asked them, is there anything that pupils would have liked to have been taught? So we had um, a significant proportion say no or unsure, but from those that did respond yes, you can see on the graph the breakdown of that. And um, the majority of it was more practicals and actually more food skills and techniques. So they talked about knife skills, they talked about um, using kitchen appliances, but then they also talked about other things which we wouldn't traditionally think about as practical food skills or techniques, including flavor combination, catering for dietary needs, making quick meals, food presentation, and also making meals from scratch. And then the wider variety of recipes, some of the examples they came up with were Japanese, Nigerian curries, so that could be Indian or could be from um, other areas of the world, pizza, and then also healthy meals. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to unshare and then I'm going to come back in a minute to this food skills, recipes and diversity, but I'm going to unshare and I'm going to ask Andrew to share his slides and then he'll go through his presentation and I'll come back at the end. So Andrew, would you like to join us? Okay, um, thanks for coming guys. Here am I. So I've been this 11 years. I trained at BCU under Suzanne Lawson. Uh, she was like a scary Mary Poppins, but made me the teacher I am. Um, it's never, it's been hard at times, sort of going to play on my first placement. And then I met Louise Davies, We've done loads of stuff. We started Grub Club, won a couple of awards. Uh, we had a whole deer coming to school one day and we skinned it. It had an arrow sticking out of its chest um, and we broke it down and cooked the dinner. Um, we bought a brand new kitchen. We worked with Raymond Blanc uh, and then mine's CPD. I've got out to Mission Star restaurants and got shouted at a lot and learned a lot even. Uh, so that's been good. Um, and I was really keen to do this because I think what we're doing as food teachers is really, really important. And I was at a, a thing the other night and they were talking about, you know, why do you do what you do? It's about leveling the playing field. You know, a lot of our young people, uh, you know, they're going to get on because of what we do, not because they can talk about Act 3, Scene 2 and Romeo and Juliet. Um, I want to change the status quo. I think our subject has so much potential. Uh, can be so exciting, so engaging, um, so informative, creative, scientific, academic, accessible, like no other subject can be. Um, and also really make sure that we, we make sure that food is secure on the curriculum. Um, and we all know textiles colleagues who have had a rough time of it and textiles has often been absorbed and lost and it'd be, it'd be an absolute tragedy if that happened to food. Um, so a few things we've done. Um, this is a very old video of the earliest incarnation of Grub Club. Um, and it was quite a simple thing. It was uh, pupil premium students would come along at the end of the day and would cook with whatever's knocking around. We'd sit down, we'd set a table, and it was very laissez-faire. What we got, what can we cook? Very simple, cheap things. Um, but we'd have a band playing. Um, so they'd come in period five, set up the amps and drums. And it was very much a very convivial Friday last thing. So the kids turned up and that was a very old kitchen and I'd not long started teaching and we just cooked, sat down and ate. And you know, it was just a lovely sociable foodie environment. Um, now I'm at Finn and Park 2. Um, some of the things we do for our curriculum, so there's no rotations here. Um, key stage three, which is year seven and eight, have an hour a week um, all year, which is amazing. Uh, it really allows us to explore, get deep into skills. And I'm very fortunate when I know a lot of you guys may get them for nine weeks or 12 weeks. Um, but you know, some of you may have double lessons, which I kill for. Uh, we have a three year key stage four, which again, we can really, once you get those students who are really desperate to be in here, we can really up the skills like year nine, we're having pigeons today. So we've been preparing those next week, it's mackerel. Um, and it allows us to go deep onto those skills. We buy the ingredients in. So we ask for a contribution for the year and for the entire year, we currently charge 25 pounds. That's gonna have to go up as you, you're all aware of the cost of food, and it's use of pupil premium money. So I go to the pupil premium uh, deputy, and I just say I need £25, and it's just paid into the budget. We order it in. Some of it's from uh, suppliers, but most of it is from supermarkets. But we have unapologetically high standards. Um, we call each other chef um, out of respects. We have aprons, we have hats, we have routines. 
all the kitchen units are named after local Michelin star restaurants. So I might say, right, you're going to work at Cross today. I want you in charge of Simpsons. Um, and, and we just have that expectation that kids are going to aspire to the best they can be. Um, leadership team are immensely supportive. I know it's not true across all schools, but hopefully we can sort of bridge that gap and give you some ideas about how we can get them on board. And the other thing we do is we try and really promote the subject and make us unavoidable that those people who do control the purse strings and the curriculum say, well, we've got, we've got to get behind these guys. And across our multi-academy trust, we did, uh, and we do up until COVID, a uh, film festival, like an Oscars, and we cater for it, and we do a four or five course, fine dining, tasting menu. Uh, it's another great way of promoting your subjects. Again, if you've got supportive leadership, you can get a day off timetable to prep it all. Um, and the kids really buy into it. And when you set the bar here, they tend to go for it. So you get the idea. We had um, 12 year 10s working on that and they were in it like 7.30 in the morning, worked till 10 at night. I'm pretty sure that's breaking some EU working rules. And uh, the standard of food is fine dining. We have people from Marvel Films. And don't be mistaken, those students there, our catchment is over a third of our students in the lowest 10% deprivation in the country. It's another reason I feel really passionately about food and its place in the curriculum and what it can do. We've done some uh, sound bites about what students like, much like uh, Nutrition Foundation have done. They like to learn new skills. They like to be treated like they're good at what they're doing. Interesting stuff they can do at home. I did this again today, no one's gonna do this. And the students say, oh, do you, are you on TikTok, Chef? I'm like, yeah, yeah. Not really, but, but that sort of format, that quick snippy format is what's going to engage them. It doesn't mean dropping standards. It's just about how we package things, I think, for them. Parents are happy about building confidence, independence, initiative, tenacity. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but especially this year seven coming from COVID, uh, they're probably the least able group, the least independent group looking for reassurance that I've ever had. We've really had to build on that. A deeper understanding is something that other students want to know. Um, and we take really boring, simple ingredients. Nothing of what we order in really is spectacular. You know, we're not getting in foie gras, we're not getting in ribs of beef. Uh, at Key Stage 3, it is 100% plant-based because we order it in logistically. We can't, we can't guarantee the meats. Uh, and we don't, I have two hours technician support four days a week, um, which makes it very pro problematic. Uh, I did this article this a while ago, so you may have seen it. And I received a lot of, uh, I got told I received some unpleasant comments about well, fairy cakes and fruit salad are fine. I really don't think they are, and I'm sorry if that offends, but they're just not. This is an important subject, and the skills you learn doing those, yes, they are important, but I think we need to move on from that. There's so many better, more interesting ways than sending home a box of soggy fruit or slightly dense cake. Uh, if you want to do cake making, why can't we do orange and polenta? Um, if you want to do knife skills, why can't we do a mirepoix or a sofrito for a ragu? There are so many better ways of doing it. And I just think that a bit of creativity and some sharing ideas, and we can really raise the profile even more of what our great subject can achieve. So this is what I think the ideal curriculum is. And I've sat down and I do ask for money from the head for things and I have to justify it. So it is all about the stakeholders, wherever they are. And I don't think it should be a one size fits all. If you're teaching down by the coast, you absolutely should be looking at what affects their environment. If you're working around farming community, then it should link to that. If you're working in a predominantly uh, black or Asian or um, doesn't matter what it is, it should reflect your stakeholders and be relevant to them. Um, there's big discussions about this in English about what books and what, how are they relevant? The national curriculum is so broad to us and it lacks so much detail that we've got carte blanche and we can really tailor it to fit the young people walking into our kitchen. It should be modern, engaged, and exciting. Ingredients and dishes and cooking methods again should reflect the community. I am trying to build responsible consumers. So we do talk about higher welfare. Um, our budget doesn't stretch to organic always, but we, we certainly never buy battery hens, uh, eggs ever. We have everybody cooking all the time. Um, I think to not, especially if you've only got a nine or a 12 week rotation, it is, is really not great for anybody. I uh, respect for the subject. Um, I still have some colleagues who mock me and say I'm the king of chopping a cucumber. 
but in here we take it seriously. It is, it is a it is an important subject that brings in every other facet. And it's knowledge and skills focused. So it's not just what they're doing, it's what they're learning. And this is this is saying, so we did some work with Henry Dimbleby. And is there an insurmountable paradox between what the future of food education is and what it needs to be? And by that, I mean, I still think it's absolutely criminal that our students have to pay to learn in whatever format, whether we order the ingredients in or whether they're remembering at 10 o'clock at night and mom has to go to the one stop and buy everything from there. It's not right. You don't see kids having to wander down to PE, having bringing in their javelins. They're not bringing in their hydrochloric acid to science. So why are they having to pay to learn in here? And hopefully that's something that will change in the future. Um, but again, accessing the pupil premium money uh, for those students who can access it and make sure they're cooking at least is important. The other thing we do is we also, within that money we charge, we supply the takeaway boxes that are fully compostable and they add between 10 and 12p for each dish. Um, obstacles, I'm just going to move my little camera thing. There are plenty of obstacles. Um, I'm really lucky. I've got a great kitchen. Um, we're a school that's been open eight years. Uh, so we've got amazing facilities. I've got some technician support, not everybody does. The skill level of our students. Um, I, I, had, I had a discussion with a food teacher about lockdown. I said, why aren't you doing more lockdown cooking? A lot of our students don't have access to any sort of kitchen of any merit or a parent with the skills. So again, the skill level of your students and their cultural capital knowledge around food and cooking can really determine what you're doing. Like I've gone to other schools to help out and the difference is, is enormous from school to school. Um, teaching constraints. We only have so many hours. I've got two small children. I've got a two and a half year old and a five week old. And it is hard and it is a balancing act. And it's about working smarter and planning and using that time. And one of the things we do is, because we have it all year, we have a mise en place lesson. So as I might do a demonstration and then the kids will do their mise en place, we'll rack it, we'll freeze it, they'll get it out next lesson. So it means next lesson, all they're doing is they're just cut it, they're just they're cooking, sorry. Uh, budget, um, budgets can be hugely varied. My first school, it, I think it was like, overly generous, it was, it was silly. Uh, this school, it's a lot tighter. It has to be linked to your subject action plan. Um, and you can't carry budgets over, so there's, there's no hoarding money away. So you have to be very careful about what we're buying. And again, we don't buy expensive ingredients. When I think about a lot of our dishes that you'll see soon, they are staple ingredients, cheap ingredients. Curriculum time, I've mentioned it before. If you're on a rotation, you've got to strike that balance between the theory and the practical. I think practical is way more important i really do uh, i think you can only learn about cooking by doing it um lesson time i know some of you guys may only have 50 minute lessons i have an hour lesson i think 10 minutes by the time they get in and they know what they're doing 15 minutes clear up it probably leaves you what i'd say about 20 minute hot time 30 minute hot time at the most um there's external pressures VBAC subjects and how much time they can give you and again it's asserting yourself and showing what you can be um, there's the head and the governors. I'm very, very lucky. I've got a very supportive head. I've worked for heads who aren't supportive. And it's about raising that bar and making yourself unavoidably brilliant. And then saying, we just have to get behind this because the kids are loving it. They're making great progress. You're giving them great opportunities, which I know so many of you are. Um, governors as well. Um, I've had governors who are trying to be hands on and they've tried to dictate what we cook. And that's, that's very hard to have that conversation. Parents, this is a brilliant. I've had parents, I've had parents say, why aren't you cooking more British things? Um, I'm not sure what that means, to be honest. Our number one food is, is uh, curry. Um, so I'm not really sure what is British and what isn't. Um, I think you have to take it back to skills. And then I put giving up SH1C. That is really hard. If you're being ground down, if you've got a head who's not giving you the time, if you've got a head of the department who doesn't understand you, if you've got an awful budget, if your kitchen's falling apart and you've got a class size of 30 and you're having to do half cooking, half theory, it's really hard to keep going day after day. But actually, I found the thing that's worked most is caring and keeping those standards every single day. And after a while, they have to give in and give you what you need. 
non-specialists. So for the first time, we've had non-specialist cooking. And that's a huge drain on your time, health and safety, logistics, giving them the confidence to do it. When they run over and you're coming in, how do you get around that? That can be a massive battle as well. Subject snobbery, um, fruit salads and fairy cakes. And it is, and that's why I hate them so much because it takes us back to a time of food tech when people are designing pizzas nine, 10, 12 times and then making them once. We're so much more than that. We're food scientists, we're creatives, we're hardworking. I love it when the kids say that they've worked so hard that they've got more of a sweat than they have in PE. I think it's great. Um, career focus. Uh, have you heard parents turn around to go, well, why would they choose food? They're not going to be a chef. They're not going to be a stove monkey. Well, it's more than that. Food scientists, recipe developers, private chefs, um, marketing. There's so much more they can do, and we have to make them aware of that through our lessons. And then the kids themselves. Um, I've walked into schools where kids hate food because it's boring. And that's why recipe selection is, is, is so important and how you deliver it. One of the things I picked up from the last conference that I have put on there is the stress. Um, we're so rushed that food lessons can be very intense and very stressed. So again, having that mise en place lesson where you go, right, I'm going to do some demonstration. You guys do your mise en place. We'll get it backed up. We'll get it frozen. We'll get it fridged. We'll get it stowed away. And the next lesson we're just doing. So here's some of the dishes we do in year seven and eight. Um, and every one of these works out at G either just under or just over a pound a student. So the couscous, harissa, roasted halloumi, fresh coriander and pomegranate. Um, again, you can vary this depending on what's going on. We're not afraid to use frozen veg in here um, to, avoid, to avoid sort of spoilage and throwing things away. And also the kids can learn that actually frozen veg is absolutely fine to use, especially on a budget. Again, our kids are on the lowest 10% of deprivation and having the courage to access those things. And about, I have parents say, why would I buy this to do this at home? I'm just going to throw it away. Again, the cakes, orange, polenta, orange and polenta cake with time dribble icing. We've got a small kitchen garden and they go out, they pick their time bring it to the lesson yaki soba noodles that works out at 60p um, and those ingredients then can be used for lots of other things like um, the leftover rice wine vinegar we just used today by year eight to make their kimchi for their dish next week tartar chocolat so we're still doing sweet things um, and that pastry making so we will spend the lesson talking about shortening talking about plasticity of fat blind baking all those things um about celiac about gluten free and we do a really simple ganache filling and spoiler alert, it's the cheapest Nutella you can get your hands on and double cream. And it makes a ganache and it's baked very simply. Uh, jalapeno cornbread. So again, weighing, measuring, testing for redness. Chili con carne with two secret ingredients. Now all of these, all these recipes go on my website and there's always optional extra. So they're not prescriptive because we will have students who go, I want to bring this in. Can I try bringing this into the tartar chocolat? Some of them might bring some peanut butter because they want to do a Reese's Pieces version. Um, we don't labour healthy eating, don't eat fat, don't eat sugar, don't eat salt, because I find it just turns kids off and you become a bit of a, a dullard. So a few sweet things, showing them their enjoyable application is important. Uh, curry in a hurry with two ingredient naan. Very simple, lots of tins used. Or zotto, that's happening in a couple of weeks. And it's just cream cheese, mushrooms, orzo pasta, a little bit of stock. Uh, one we came up with lockdown, boff, back of the fridge pie. And again, using leftovers. And we start the science of gelatinization in year seven by doing things like, um, okay, saute in the pan, dusting of flour, stock on, that's your pie filling, goes into the container, and then they can top it with sliced potato, uh, mash, um, they can do puff pastry, phyllo pastry. And it's that skill to take home. They're just a little bit more interesting, a little bit different. And they can add things like an ando sauce to that, essentially what is a veloute sauce. The focaccia, that's one of the first ones we do. And it's just a wow moment. We do a little thing where we do about fermentation and we give the kids a balloon, a Haribo, a hairdryer and a water gun. And they simulate how fermentation works. So we're accessing the food science from early on. In year eight, uh, nice skills on butternut squash soup. It's a Thai butternut squash soup, although sometimes you can't get enough in. We do harissa. Uh, risotto, they're all, you know, again, so varied. We give them a few bits and bobs, but if they want to bring in some leftover cooked chicken or they want to bring in some chorizo, um, they do that. 
pasta donata, it's the Jamie Oliver recipe, and we talk about coagulation, about lamination. Uh, tandoori chicken, so in year eight, um, so we do do a little bit more meat prep, we talk about denaturation and how marinades work, but again, there's the option to do the cauliflower version, which goes down very well. Um, through gas, sorry guys, I'm sitting around my kitchen one second. My gas shuts off at this time, and all you're gonna hear it's a really annoying beep, apologies. So I'm just gonna turn my gas off. Yeah, apologies for that. Um, we do a fresh pasta. Again, we're very lucky. Um, I just wrote to Nisbet. I strongly recommend some companies and ask for some pasta machines. You'll be amazed how often they go. Yeah, go on then. Uh, and it's the same for the heads. Once they see these things going on, they very much like to back it. Um, Lasagna, absolute classic. And I think it's the British Nutrition Foundation, the Food of Fact of Life one, um, the Lenta one. Uh, kids are very skeptical, but you start to work proteins and replacement and how quick it is. And again, they can make a fresh pasta for that. Jackfruit bao. Um, quite often we'll buy the bao buns in. We've got a great Korean supermarket. It's about knowing what's on your doorstep. The mac and cheese, it says truffled, but one bottle of truffle oil does 120 kids because they need a tiny amount and they're engaged with truffle oil. And we do have, we get a truffle in every now and again and we tell them how much it is. Chocolate mousse, so aeration, more food science. We get them walking up and down the corridors with the bowls over their heads, and give it a jump. The best. Everything we do is really cheap, but different and engaging and a little bit challenging because when they know they're going to do a brownie, they're like, oh, good. And then you put beetroot and it's like, mm, and then they try and feel good again. So it's about challenging them and opening up their taste buds. You see, these are some of the things we've done in the last year. The one on the far left was a year 10, panna cotta, uh, souffle, something that you do in year nine, uh, pasta for year eight. Uh, and we do expect really high standards. So see, these are some of the dishes from our key stage four. Uh, experimentation, the dish down the bottom there was done for half term, some mackerel, and that was curing and sousing and blow torching. Uh, we like to have the ingredients, like fresh ingredients. So uh, all those herbs you can see there came out of our kitchen garden. But everything there is cheap. Mushrooms are cheap. Onions are cheap. Um, and that's the cassoulet. And you say cassoulet and don't know what it is. It's just sausage and beans. Um, we can't afford the confit de canard. Um, but it doesn't matter. They've got the idea. We have chef hats as well. And to avoid the stress, you know, I put all the videos of what we're going to do up on the website and some of them will feel very uncertain. And depending on what hat they're wearing is how much support they want. So we've got a head chef there supporting a commie chef. Sorry, my cleaner wants to come in and hoover in a minute. Is that all right? Thanks, Carla. Um, we use game. We have some students, parents who work uh, beating, um, you know, and keep dogs and they bring us in pheasant, partridge, grouse, quail. And the middle one is the first lesson of year nine. The first lesson of year nine, we butcher a chicken work with every step of it. And you can see from the balloons there, that's the fermentation lesson. Um, presentation is key. We try and do everything to the highest standard we can. And what else we've got? Oh, and then the middle picture there you can see is Grub Club. We do trips. We go to Borough Market. We used to go to Dig the Dining Club before it relocated, just to give them that cultural capital and contextualize their learning. Sustainability. We've got our small holding. Homework. And um, this is a real sticky one. And it's something I've tried this year. And I'd love to get your ideas on this. I don't know about you. Homework, you can have huge engagement from. I've done sheets. I've tried to do various different things in the box. And I found I was chasing homework. It's fostering bad relationships with students. They were great in the kitchen, brilliant. It's going, where's your homework? You've got to stay in at lunchtime. And then it was late and it had no relevance. So we come up with a new thing that we're trying at the minute, which is while they're clearing up, I'll either go into the stock room or if it's key stage three, I'll stay in the kitchen and I'll record a short video of the What Want Wells and the EBIs. And in Google, I'll just upload it to Google Classroom from my phone and I'll ask them to set themselves a target for the next lesson. And that's it. And this is the kind of thing I'm giving back. It takes like a minute or two and it takes about similar time to see who's responded to it. And it's a great talking point during your next practical. So all I was going through, they were doing a, a ravioli with a champagne blue. So when it's champagne, it was no secco from Aldi. Um, but it was feedback. So what they were doing well, the great work ethic, that the time plans had lots of details, the use subject specific, uh, specialist terms, accurate estimated timings. And then the EBIs were things like 
be careful that you take from the sauce so it doesn't overreduce and catch that um that you roll the ravioli thin enough so it's things they could action next time that was that was it really guys that's my curriculum in a nutshell um they're the socials you want to go and see what we're doing um and i, I love comments challenging question if you want anything ping me a message i'll send it to you if you ever want to come and visit us we cook up until the last full week of term uh, you're more than welcome to sit in here i've got a coffee machine if you like your caffeine come and have a coffee and just watch i'd love to have the feedback um, and, and share ideas so thank you so much for your time and i think that's about me okay so hopefully you can see my presentation now and i was really just wanting to just recap on some of the work that we've been doing with this project about a modern food and nutrition education and through this we've been looking at food skills recipes and diversity so we put together a range of new resources to support teaching different global cuisines and these are really sort of based on the workshops that we've been doing so we've got the powerpoint presentations from the workshops plus some sort of cuisine information sheets and they're all available on the website and then we've been developing some recipes. So um, there are some pictures, some of the recipes on, on the screen, but we're aiming for these recipes to be suitable and practical for schools, thinking about budgets, uh, promoting healthier eating, reflecting global cuisines, but also particularly to encourage a dialogue in, around culture and inclusivity. And uh, I like the comment that Andrew made about cucumber, because one of the recipes that we've got, um, which will be online next week, is a Polish recipe, which is a cucumber salad. And um, very, very simple recipe, but actually the precision and the accuracy that's needed in order to prepare the ingredients well and actually to have a really nice outcome are really important. So what is uh, could be quite a low complexity recipe, and if you're interested in our complexity ratings, there's lots of information on the website about it, but actually it produces a really nice outcome that the pupils will be really sort of careful about making and really pleased to actually present something nice and neatly and attractively at the end. So those are some new recipes and some new resources. Okay. Right, just making sure it's moving. Okay, so one of the things that um, we're always very, very keen on talking about at um, BNF is about the fact that um, recipes should be regarded as a vehicle for learning. The recipe shouldn't really be the outcome. It's the skills that the pupils are actually using. They should be the outcome. So um, at the top of the screen, those of you who are teaching in England would recognize this. This is the program of study for key stage three, cooking and nutrition, and it's fairly sort of broad. But from that, we actually feel that the important thing you need to be thinking about is the practical food skills. And those are the different actions that the pupils are going to be using in order to make a dish. And you start off with fairly basic food skills maybe, and then you extend them and you practice them, and then the pupils become proficient. Then you do the same with equipment. So you start off with fairly basic equipment, and then you extend it, and you use the different parts of the cooker, you use different electrical tools, and you practice them, and again, you become proficient. And then you think about the accuracy and precision, safety and hygiene, the complexity of the recipes, the combination of the skills that are being used. And then also you think about the Eat Well Guide and you're thinking about making savoury dishes, predominantly savoury, that you're thinking about variety of ingredients and looking at different cuisines, that you're thinking about creativity because quite a large part of what we're meant to be doing is not about getting pupils just to be able to follow a recipe, it's to be able to take a recipe and then adapt it and then eventually, as Andrew's doing, is getting the pupils to look in their fridge and saying, oh, I've got four different ingredients this is what I can make with it, rather than having to rely on a website or on a recipe in a book. And then also thinking about people and, and diversity and thinking about dishes that the young people want to make, but also that are going to be good for their families and their lifestyles. So really the re important thing that we feel is to remember that a recipe should support learning objectives and intent, but not be the, the main outcome. You shouldn't be saying, okay, this week we are going to make quiche, perhaps, but it's going to be this week we are going to 
practice our life skills, we're going to practice our pastry making skills, we're going to learn about coagulation. And the final outcome through all of that is going to be a quiche movie. So finally, it's all about context. And I mentioned earlier on that we had a consensus building event back in October last year, and Andrew presented at that. And we, from that, we have got a list of 10 recommendations. And these are three recommendations from that event. And um, what we really feel, and this was the consensus from everybody attending the, the conference, that teaching should reflect the now, but could, should continue to evolve with change. And that food nutrition ultimately should, should be for all pupils and should be diverse and inclusive. And Andrew's mentioned that, that everybody should be cooking where possible. Um, schemes of work and learning should include dishes that pupils want to make. We want to in, encourage them, we want to excite them, we want them to come to the lessons and learn, but also that should reflect their families and their lifestyles. But they should be in a context of healthy and sustainable diets. And it's being aware of your community and uh, what might be suitable for Andrew's school may not be suitable for where you are and the pupils that you're working with and the families that you're working with. But then also pupils should be given the opportunities to use ingredients that they are initially familiar with, with and then extended over time to broaden their learning experiences. And it sounds what Andrew's doing actually really does that. So they start off with some basic ingredients, first of all, and then they develop and they try different things and actually learn about handling, cooking and tasting a variety of ingredients. Just thinking sort of a, a general question to start with. So um, what do you think the top key practical food skills? So we're actually talking about sort of the practical actions in order that are needed to make a dish. Um, what you think, do you think the, the key food skills are that should be taught in key stage three? So if we're in England, key stage three, but around the rest of the UK, so 11 to 14 years. Uh, it's a brilliant question. So I'll be resting this one. I'm going to say not weighing and measuring. I know this is really contentious, but at home, with the exception of baking, how often do you really, really, really weigh and measure? And how, uh, how, you know, how important is it? So if you're doing a risotto, how often do you go, right, I'm going to weigh 210 grams of rice? Or do you say, well, that's, that's about it? So it's, it's that maybe more estimation, I'd say, and understanding what a portion size is. I think knife skills are absolutely essential. I think they're so important, the speed, the confidence. Um, we had an English teacher come down the other day. She came down just asked me a couple of questions about something. And I was doing, uh, you know, the old claw and, and the bridge and we're chopping away and kids were laughing at how fast I was doing it. And then I said, you have a go. And we'll pick it up why it was wrong, why it was slow and uneven. I think using your senses to inform how you're cooking so that independence, I don't know if you've had it, you've stood out, you've, you can smell it across the room, can't you? You can smell the inferno starting from the back of the room and you're going, oh crap. And you go, did you not, did you not think it was smelling warm or you could smell bitterness or you could hear it and do you not think you had to adjust the heat? So I think heat control is really important. Knife skills, understanding when a process is done at key stage three, I think that's really important, especially when we have tight time constraints. So I'd say like, I sometimes will have a waggle for each, we call it a waggle, what a good one looks like. So I might have, um, say for the focaccia dough, what it should look like. And I'll have it on my unit and they can go up and have a look and have a prod. I don't use it because they don't want all their hands in my focaccia, quite frankly, even though they wash them. So as I will very much leave it up there, say, right, does it look like this? And something have to prompt, go, well, is it wetter? Is it dry? If it's wetter, what do you need to add? If it's dry, what do you need to add? And it's that encouraging them to inform how to adjust their cooking process using their sense. I think that's absolutely key and essential because that builds the confidence and it's that confidence to do when they go home because if they don't know when things are done, then they're less likely to do them. So I think, yeah, nice skills, that sensory information and knowing how to adjust it, heat control, um, and also a bit of fun as well. I think having a bit of fun. So we had we had a lad, and he's he can't sit back unit over there, and that's cracking it. We've done mini toad in the hole, froglets in puddles, mini toad in the hole, and we use broccoli instead of sausages in year seven. And um he cracked the egg and he missed a jug by so much. I think I put it on the social on my social media. It was like this: jug there, egg over here. And you have to laugh at it. I mean, you can get ticked, of course you can when you're tired. So it's having that fun element of it as well. I think that's really important. And uh, bring the social element in. 
and a bit of the banter. So they're, they're, they're my skills at Key Stage 3. Love of it is, is so important. And the fear that failure is okay. That's mm-hmm. a really key skill. So, it's, you know, if they're going to maths and they get an equation wrong, it's not the end of the world. I think because, again, we go back to the logistics, time, uh, finance. We have an added pressure to make sure there's almost zero failure. And that's not really learning. That's just ushering 20, 30 kids through a cooking lesson every hour. So, yeah, I think allowing controlled failure is a really important skill. Yeah. And, and then knowing what to do when things go wrong. Yeah, absolutely. So that they can improve it next time. Yeah, absolutely. OK, but well, that's great. Thank you. That's, re- that's really interesting. So um, another one really was about um, the most popular recipe that you think you've made with the pupils. Year eight is easy. Year eight is easy. Chocolate mousse. Chocolate mousse. <laughs> okay. They are, you know, I've got parents trying to slide into my DMs to ask for the recipe. You know, it's it's not right. But yeah, chocolate mousse they love. But my ones I really enjoy are the ones that they didn't think they were going to like. So they're really good. Uh, they all like the focaccia and the fugas breads that we do. Um, one that I've started to knock on the head is anything soup based. I'm not going down great. I've got to think of another way of doing that. So you can guarantee almost anything sweet is always going to go down pretty well. The savory dishes, it has to be punchy with flavour. So the cassoulet is a big hit that you'd think was going to be. The vegetarian curry in year seven, I think that's the third dish we do. Um, and that's a huge hit. There's that scepticism because it's so used to default chicken curry, you know, cheapo chicken, jar of sauce, or straight from the takeaway. Uh, and then the more able ones that they can make an arm bread with uh, self-raising flour and yogurt. That you know, that's a that's an enormous hit, um, and they're, they're they're ones that will never come off. New recipes, the kimchi and noodles has gone down brilliantly. The jackfruit bao bun um, has gone down really really well. And we're going to keep changing. We've got some more ideas that I'll check on the website. But I, I I tend to add to each repertoire of like 15, 20 dishes, a couple more each year, just to keep myself fresh as well. That's really important. Um, and some I resurrect, like I haven't done the froglets and puddles, the you know, mini toad and hold in eight years. And I got it out this year and it's cheap. It's batter, it's batter and broccoli, but the kids love it. And you can add a bit of curry powder to it, to the mixture. And all of a sudden anything with curry and they go mad for. So yeah, that, they, they've all been massive hits. That's great. That's really good. And we have a bow bun recipe on the website if you're interested in making them. Um, uh, we had a question from somebody about um, hiring your equipment for your events. So do you have the equipment or do you hire it? Uh, right. So it used to be back in the day, we used to UCB, the food college. I used to, because I used to go on a Friday before kids. I used to finish school on a Friday at three, go across and do a service with their degree students in their restaurant, maybe a few beers at the end as well. Um, but because that relationship, and when you've got the relationship with colleges and restaurants and even event companies, you can ping them a text and go, oh, I need 80 plates, can I have 80 plates? Sometimes that's not possible. Um, and it's about building up a collection over time. You know, actually plates, you can get relatively cheap. Wilco's have been a godsend. So when you're looking at really nice plates, they do some fantastic ones relatively cheap. Um, you can... Little tip here. Um, so we charge the kids about 25 quid um, for the ingredients. Now, the mat rule is very simple. If we ch- if it's over by four pounds, we have to refund it. Right? Anything over four pounds, we have to refund. Anything o- under four pounds. And I do overcharge slightly to allow for inflation in ingredients, spoilage, accents, whatever. But as it gets towards the end of the year, if you've got a few hundred students and there's an extra pound from each one, that easily like easily covers stuff for events, like not an issue. Um, you can do that. Um, refectory or your canteen or your kitchen may be able to help you out as well. Um, that, that can often work. Um, local businesses, we've got all our tablecloths and napkins um, from an events company. Beg, borrow and steal. Beg, borrow and steal. Maybe not okay. steal or get caught. Don't Still don't get caught. Mm. Give them back afterwards. Um, Right, but that's really helpful. So hopefully that, that's answered the, the question that was put in the chat box. Um, somebody's asked about the exam qualification that you teach. Right, we're just about to move. We've been doing the food preparation nutrition with uh, WJC EDGCAS. Uh, it's, it's been fine. It's been fine. Um, I, I've fallen a bit out of love with the depth of the content, to be honest. I think I don't see, some of it I don't see as relevant. That's just my opinion. I'm sure lots of people disagree. 
Um, I'm now going to move to the hospitality and catering one. And the very simple is the rule change. The rule change that used to be if they nosed up the exam, they were done for, weren't they? It was game over. That's changed. Uh, so we're moving to that from September. Um, so it's our current year nines and the year eights coming into year nine will begin the hospitality and catering. So if anybody out there is smashing it and nailing it and wants to come and spend a couple of days here and we can swap resources, again, I have great coffee. So please, thank you. Great. You're selling it well. Oh, and yes, um, we're about to top of the T level as well. So a oh, couple of years, right. we've got a second kitchen being built with T level funding. I think we're going to be one of the only schools offering the T level. Uh, that's that, that's really exciting. Really exciting. Right. With the exception of Birmingham, all the other food colleges are closed. So it'll be a unique offering in the area. That's brilliant to me. That's that's really good. A um, couple more questions because I know that um, we're running out of time so um how and where do you source your ingredients uh, majority of supermarkets majority of supermarkets uh and you have to be a bit canny with it so for instance like chocolate mousse you know i need 60 big bars of chocolate you can only order 10 at a time so you tend to hoard them we do two or three supermarkets so if i know i'm doing chocolate mousse around christmas time right now the orders i'm putting in i'll buy 10 at a time and before you know in four or five orders you, you've got enough um fish fresh fish um i'll phone up a local fishmonger uh get on the phone say can you supply but that most of them if you say you're a school they'll sort you out they'll invoice you and uh, they'll either drop it to you or if you have got a technician and they're lovely they might go down and pick it up that can happen too. so it's fresh feet uh, fresh meat fresh fish we do it that way but most other things come through supermarkets um Great companies like Wellux aren't really interested in schools from what I've found, which is a real shame. Um, and Or you can sometimes piggyback like I do, like oil. If you guys can't get hold of oil at the minute because of what's happening in Ukraine and then being the major producer, speak to your canteen. They're getting 25 litre vats of it and you can probably piggyback an order with them if you've got a good relationship with them. I find that helps. Great, great. That's useful. Thank you. Um, Right, two more questions. Um, you mentioned your website. Um, is it your own website or is it a school website? No, it's mine. I can send the link out. It's a Wix website. It's always been updated. I just evolve it every now and again. I chuck the recipes on there and I, I want to get it up to scratch. It's been there or thereabouts. And it's just that time. And when it is, I will send the link out. And guys, please just help yourself. I think we do the best subject, but logistically by far the hardest subjects. Um, no other subject has to wash tea towels and dishcloths. Um, you know, French don't have to worry about giving food poisoning through their videos or their textbooks, do they? So, you know, we've got a tougher gig here. So, yeah, anything I've got is anybody's, I don't mind. That's very generous of you. And then the final question was actually about plating, and I think you might have covered this just towards the end, but somebody asked about um, how you teach plating and presentation. Yeah, um, so again... I do sit at home where it's like watch MasterChef the professionals. I never tell them to watch the amateurs because I know they're trying hard, but it looks a dog's dinner most of the time. Um, I watch Netflix Chef's Table. We have great books from Top Chefs and I colour copy them and they're up around the room. I do demonstrations. Um, I blagged my way onto the PGC. I couldn't really cook. And I thought, oh crap, I better learn to cook. So I phoned up top restaurants in Birmingham in the Midlands and said, can I come and starge? And I learned a lot, a lot that way. I know lots of chefs, if you ask them to, will happily come in and do a plating thing. The easiest way is bag of frozen peas, to squeeze your tubes, a bag of frozen peas, boiling water, wazz it all up, keep your raised little dots. Uh, avoid symmetry, that's a big thing. Please try and avoid symmetry because it will always look wrong. Uh, go for asymmetrics, ones, threes, fives. Um, yeah, try and avoid anything too gimmicky as well because it, it, never, it just never comes off. And remember, there should be quite a large ratio of plate to food, the plate should frame it. Um, and almost sparse with the elements to make them shine. 